in order to have a global perspective, we have to have a deep respect for other cultures. Um, so just as we have to have um, interracial respect, we have to have intercultural respect. And just like we have to have intercultural respect, we have to have uh, interfaith respect. Talk a little bit about what you mean by modern spirituality. Well, and what is the opposite of modern spirituality? Well, the opposite of modern spirituality is um, the literalistic relationship, the dogmatic relationship to religious tradition. Mm -hmm. So modern spirituality is about direct experience of one's own higher nature. Um, it's, and it's a de-emphasis on the rituals or the, or the studies that get you there. And it's a, it's a re-emphasis on the experience itself. So modern spirituality is based on the premise that this is now a, a global society in a way that it has never been before. And in order to have a global perspective, we have to have a deep respect for other cultures. Um, so just as we have to have um, interracial respect, we have to have intercultural respect. And just like we have to have intercultural respect, we have to have uh, interfaith respect. Mm -hmm. And so respect isn't, I respect your choice to be that religion, which is the wrong religion, but I'm going to choose to have <laughs> you're going to go to hell, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I believe yeah. you're going to hell. Uh, but I respect your choice to go to hell. You know, that's not respect. That's not authentic. That's not spiritual. That is um, the human lower nature problem with the spiritual lineages and spiritual traditions. You know, mm. the, the, the idea of comparative religion versus collaborative religion Comparative religion is an emphasis on sort of like a, a precise academic study of, well, this tradition does this ritual like this. This tradition does this ritual like that. Here's where they're different. Collaborative re religious studies um, came through my desire to identify the ways that we agree for the benefit of the whole. So mm -hmm. what are the things that um, the people of all the different faiths can agree on because that's the foundation upon which the new era of peace will be established. So we're, we're not going to establish a peaceful world without wars and without chaos and without race-based violence and without um, prejudices. We're not going to establish that world from, from identifying the ways that we're, that we're different. You know, We can celebrate the ways that we're different but we don't have to sit here and say, ah, see, the thing is you believe this and therefore you're wrong because the truth is actually this. Like there's, there's an entire um, set of details. They say like the devil's in the details, you know, and there's like all these little details that start to make us feel more and more different, more and more separate. And the, the idea with modern spirituality is dropping the, the mental idea of it all and softening into the actual heart-centered experience of it and, and recognizing the areas of, of harmony amongst the, the ancient lineages. Who was the avatar you had in mind when you were writing this book? What type of person? Um, <laughs> that's an interesting one. You know, I think to pick up a book called Modern Spirituality, you are very likely already having an intuitive appreciation for more than one religion and more than one tradition. So I think what I, what I tried to do with all four of my books is it's almost like a script. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, we find that people start to quote books and they quote teachers and they quote people. And so then they start to use those words like they're their own. I hear people basically quoting Marianne Williamson all the time and just they think it came from their own mind. It's, it's deepened so much. I do that. This. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's become our own. It's because we believe it now. It's, it's because we forgot its source because we've become it, you know? And so what I kind of, what my intention was with all four of my books and especially modern spirituality was to establish 
a dialogue and a language and almost like a script um, around what a lot of people might be feeling intuitively. So if, if someone was maybe raised in one religion, but they didn't, they didn't feel like that religion totally fulfilled them spiritually, or if someone found themselves attractive to multiple different traditions, um, I wanted to create a script where, uh, no matter where, no matter where you stood on that spectrum, no matter where you came from and where you're going, we could have a meeting ground. Like that Rumi quote, uh, in the space between right and wrong, there is a field, I'll meet you there. And I wanted to sort of channel, so to speak, for our generation, a very pragmatic dialogue around the, the interfaith movement. Well, I feel like, you know, um, that's, that's almost exactly what Ram Dass also represented. So you're in good company, this sort of <laughs> spiritual eclectic right. approach. This spiritual center, you know, full circle, 7,000 square feet, ragtag team of, of uh, people running it, very little money coming in, always behind in the rent, day late, dollar short. I mean, how, how did that seem like a viable option for you, for you at that it, time? For the first time in a long time, it was not about money. Mm. For the first time in a long time, it was about survival. I had already con had, had to navigate my own suicidal ideation. And I had already tr had to convince myself to survive. And then watching one of my friends not be able to make it. One mm -hmm. of my friends not being able to make it. No. And, and feeling complicit to some extent, right? Absolutely. You know, because... I was the one who was there getting magazines to take pictures of his collection of, you know, his million dollar collection of cars. I was the one taking him to all these red carpet events where we were feeling inadequate. I was, you know, I was totally part of this vortex of, of energy that was creating and exacerbating all of these dysfunctional lifestyles patterns hmm. in his reality so, so I, no it was not a viable financial decision it it really caused me to be in a challenging place financially but it i was trying to survive you know and for the first time survival was not make money to survive this was have the will in my heart to keep going another day I wrote something um, and sent it out earlier today, and it was it was talking about how in order to see the next step, you have to completely let go of your attachment to whatever is clearly not working based on how you feel inside. And you're not going to be able to see the path until you let completely let go. And uh, hearing this moment in your life, when you finally let go of the PR thing, what did you see? I saw for yourself, what was the path that you saw for yourself? All I knew was that God was real. Mm -hmm. And that I was starting to get a glimpse of spiritual maturity by having to go through actual hard things and i did not see a clear path i all i knew i didn't see light at the end of the tunnel all mm -hmm. i knew was that i was in a tunnel and that there was a way to walk and i just hoped i was walking in the right direction i i stopped drinking i I was really fortunate to never have like a very serious actual drinking problem, but I just was like, okay, that's not part of my life. Um, and I started to be of service. You know, the, the spiritual center, like you're saying, it cost us money. We made no money there. It, it cost, it was, it cost a lot of energy and anguish and love and money. <laughs> and, um, I just put everything into it and I basically moved in. I basically lived there. I was there. Um, every single day I was there for every single event. I was there to help. We, 
we did everything we could to serve the unhoused population in the area. Um, people who were going through heartbreak and pain, I did my best to be there for them. I ended up eventually reconnecting with David Kessler, who Marianne introduced me to, and I, and I did his grief counselor training. Um, and I did a number of other grief counselor trainings. I um, spent a lot of time at Deer Park Monastery, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh Zen Monastery in Southern California. I took refuge in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha. And so I had an entire period of my life where I was officially a Zen Buddhist. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that was deeply healing. I uh, met a few people and created and co-created and consulted in the opening of over 12 meditation centers. It was like 13, 14 meditation centers in Los Angeles. Um, and I taught at a bunch of them, taught at a taught everywhere. And, and anyone who teaches meditation knows that, especially as you're starting, you're not exactly making tons of money. It's and, not the profession um, for, for getting ripped. <laughs> yeah. People who want to make a lot of money, like sometimes they look at the price tags for like teaching meditation. And they're like, that's a lot. You probably make a lot of money. It's like, mm, you have to teach a lot of people to make a lot of money, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, it was a really challenging time financially, but it was deeply healing mm -hmm. and deeply rewarding. I also became vegan. And mm -hmm. for a while I was raw vegan. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, I just immersed myself in study, service and practice, you know, and, and, that, and, and, that, and that's what, what I'm referring to as your path, right? Like you couldn't right. see it necessarily but you knew that being on the red carpet was chipping away at your soul as you said right and that feeling of contracting and the stomach churning and all it just didn't feel it felt the opposite of healing and so right now you're on this new path and you're just doing whatever you feel curious about that is that is leading to healing that's making you feel that spark inside and and so you know little by little bit by bit things are kind of working out for you. You're making yourself available for service. You're helping out Marianne Williamson. You're volunteering at some of these places. And now you're, you, you know, that leads you to starting to publish books. Right. You know, I, I started to use some of my PR skills to consult for all of these different centers. Uh, right. Some of them I actually made money consulting for some of them. I kind of dished out some free consulting and uh, you know, a lot of free consulting and some classes where, you know, look, sometimes I was getting paid $0 to teach these classes, you know, and other times I was getting paid $35, you know, it's like really like pennies. And um, little by little, you know, before I knew it, I had taught thousands of people to meditate, mm -hmm. you know, and before I knew it, um, I was teaching celebrities to meditate. Before I knew it, I was teaching um, I was like leading meditations for like Elon Musk and for mm -hmm. major executives and major corporations. And, and it, and it did come through very, very organically from really from doing 20 classes a week that I was, I was like spending more money getting there to the classes than I was making in the classes, you know, and well, it was that combined with your, you, you, you think like a PR person, like you can't not see things from a, pre our perspective and that's what meditation studios and teachers are notoriously horrible at is marketing right. themselves you go to their right. websites it's like these old myspace age <laughs> websites in 2015 <laughs> and 16 and you're coming in yeah. like this fresh young perspective you know how to like get eyeballs on your stuff yeah and the only photos i even had were like these like sexy modeling photos i like didn't even have <laughs> like i didn't even have like soft relatable uh, meditation yoga photos at all I just didn't even have them you know and so the it was like a lot of GQ energy and um, mm -hmm. and so yeah it, it did stir up a lot of things and when you're teaching everywhere and when you're one of the first teachers at all these different places um, and you're kind of willing to do it for nothing you end up getting quite a few audiences especially you're willing to do it for two people and you're well before you know it, it's not two people in the room anymore. It's, it's 60 people in the room, you know, and um, having our own amazing venue 
full circle in Venice on Rose Avenue in this gorgeous building that was a Hare Krishna temple that had this like this building had its own reputation um, with amazing people like Andrew Keegan, who who brought a lot of a lot of energy into that you know, ragtag team of co-creators, you know, and then people like you coming in, we, we attracted, you know, we had Marianne Williamson there. We had light Watkins there. We had all kinds of amazing people come in. David Data uh, taught there. Um, Graham Hancock taught there. Nako Bear performed there. We, we ended up attracting a lot of interesting things. And through all those relationships, uh, you know, before you know it, me and my boyfriend at the time were in Egypt for my 30th birthday so you know fast forward 21st birthday to 30th you know nine years later um i'm in egypt we do this whole ritual i have this vision in, inside the pyramid at midnight under the full moon on my 30th birthday it's like a whole vision and then the next day i got an email that said meditation book deal offer as the subject line Hmm. And I was like, that looks like a scam. And I open it and I'm like, where's the scam? I'm like, okay, I'm being scammed. I'm like, and I decide to go ahead and take a call with these people who are going to try to charge me $50,000 to self-publish a book or whatever, you know, and, and they don't say anything about me having to pay for anything. And I'm like, this is so, I'm like, this is like kind of taking a while for them to get to the punchline and ask for my credit card number. (laughs) And, um, and I'm like fully like in disbelief that it's a real deal. And I, they send me over an offer and I'm looking at it and I'm like disoriented. I'm like confused. I send it to uh, one of the monks that was my mentor at the Deer Park Monastery. I send it to one of the monks that was my mentor at Self-Realization Fellowship. I send it to Marianne Williamson. I send it to um, Michael Beckwith. I send it to like all my little team of supporters and I was like, what do you think? What do you, what do you think I should do about this? And they're like, congratulations, you got a book deal. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, but it's like, but there's something weird about it. And I, I'll never forget, Marianne Williamson said to me, darling, I, we talked on the phone about it. I said, it's, there's something weird about it. You know, and she was like, darling, you know what we used to call this? And I was like, it's a scam, right? I'm being conned. It's like a con game. I'm being conned. And she was like, no. We used to call this being discovered. Someone discovered you. So just embrace this opportunity. Do a great job on it. I'll support mm-hmm. you in it. And, you know, be- before I know it, I've got a book out with Marianne Williamson's endorsement and Sharon Salzberg's endorsement and, and Deer Park Monastery getting behind it and Self-Realization Fellowship. I'm the only book not published by the Self-Realization Fellowship sold in the Self-Realization Fellowship bookshop, you know? Wow. And, and so, you know, like before I know it, it just like happened. And then that be- before I knew it, it sold 25,000 copies and then 35,000 and then 45,000. And, and then it's in Russian and Portuguese and French and Chinese. And, and, you know, it's like, it just sort of took on, you know, a life of its own. It didn't become a New York Times bestseller. It wasn't exactly like the top uh, publisher in the world. It, you know, there's all kinds of things. If I, from a PR perspective, the PR brain could critique it and diminish it and everything. But when, but from my truth and my authenticity, this was never a career. This is what saved my life. Teaching meditation saved my life. Practicing mm-hmm. it, yes, but sharing it with other people was how I filled my days and how I survived the darkest time in my life. And that's practical meditation for beginners. Right. Yeah. That's the, the first, my first book is practical meditation for beginners. And what, what I did that a lot of people liked, but also the traditional meditation community criticizes me about regularly um, is that I taught, I present 10 different meditation techniques. And so actually funny story, I've been to Vipassana, Gwenka Vipassana centers for the 10 day silent retreats, um, eight times I've been to eight 10 day retreats, but wow. when that, when that book came out, they, they banned me from them. Really? Because, because you are, are they... bastardizing the, <laughs> the purity of the tradition. Well, exactly. Because there are other techniques. They said, if you officially completely stop teaching 
all other techniques other than Vipassana, mm. then you can come back. Mm. And the thing is, I was also a TM practitioner and am now a Chopra Center certified primordial sound meditation mm-hmm. teacher. And I had also, I never did any certifications with the Knowles family, but through the Veda Center, I, I loved their work and followed Charlie and Tom Knowles work. And I was like a huge Light Watkins fan. And so I was, I was like, am I really going to completely renounce this entire mantra practice, which for some people that is the most effective resonant technique. And so in the book, Practical Meditation for Beginners, it's I teach open awareness, Vipassana-based meditation. I also present mantra-based techniques. I also present the, the techniques that I learned at uh, Deer Park Monastery, which is mindful eating, mindful walking, body scan, and loving kindness. I also teach things that I, that I actually learned uh, through programs at UCLA, which is sitting with difficult emotions and, um, and uh, observing emotions. And so I, it was, it couldn't be authentic for me to just renounce all that I had learned uh, in favor of one lineage, um, which has been problematic. You know, it's like you, you no longer have the support of the lineage when, when that's how you're doing it. You know, the, someone from a major, I'll just be fully transparent. Someone from Chopra Center once told me that the reason the Chopra Center hasn't had me involved in, in any kind of teaching public facing with them is because one of my books is Bible based. Mm-hmm. And she said, you have this whole Christian thing going on that, that, and that's why they hadn't invited me, you know? Um, but, but that's an authentic part of my lineage also, you know? So, so my, my second book is actually a Christian book. I kind of wrote it for my family, I guess you could say. Um, well, that's what I, I admire about your work is that, you know, you have to really, to be a proper teacher, you have to, you have to step into your own thing, right? Just like the guy who, who would you say, translated or channeled the, uh, the Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints knowledge. I mean, if you, if you trace back all, every tradition, there's going to be one guy or a girl, a woman, who channeled something or cognized something. Like they didn't get it from anywhere. They just had to kind of create it for themselves. And right. you put yourself on this sort of collaborative, religious, spiritual study journey, which I feel like has culminated in these four books and most recently in modern spirituality. And then I remember you saying, or someone telling me that you grew up, you'd done TM, you'd done all the meditations, you'd done all, you were exposed to everything. And, you know, I, I didn't, I never knew anyone who grew up who grew up like that. So let's, let's kind of pivot there. Let's talk Mm -hmm. about your childhood because um, that is interesting. And I think you're an outlier in that regard in that you grew up um, as a part of the church of the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I don't know what that means exactly. Maybe you can explain that. And then, Mm -hmm. then how did that lead to an exposure to those other more um, Eastern practices? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yeah, my ancestors founded the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, which is best known for uh, its, its scripture. They use the King James Version of the Bible, but then they also have a, a book called the Book of Mormon uh, that, the, that the founder essentially channeled. We usually say translated. He translated it. And um, the... The, the experience growing up in that atmosphere, you fe- we were Christian and we believed we were Christian and we were Christian and it was all about Jesus. Um, but every Christian I knew was like, dude, you're not Christian. Mormons are not Christian. You know, that community is not Christian. And, um, but I, I will say like internally, it was, everything was about Jesus. So we sure felt like we were Christian, but there were some key um like esoteric nuances that made it different than like evangelical Christianity. Um, And that included the receptivity to other truths outside of the religion. And so it's actually very common for members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to practice meditation 
to practice yoga. Um, my, my grandparents on my mother's side ha had a, <clears throat> had a familiarity and an interest and an appreciation for the Eastern traditions. Uh, they lived in Japan for a little while and my mother's first name, her given name is karma. Um, so just the fact that her name was karma invited a lot of really interesting conversations and questions and even gifts. People were like gifting her books about karma. Anytime someone saw the word karma on something, they bought it and they gave it to her as a gift. So she's literally got like a collection of like a cookie jar that say karma's cookies of a sign that says, I saw that karma, you know, uh, Karma's a bitch, but only if you are. Like, there's all kinds of stickers and pins and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. And a lot of Buddhist and Hindu, like, Vedic literature on the bookshelf, you know. Um, so my parents were, were very religious and very committed to the LDS church. And within that context there's a teaching of the practice of silence. And so, but we don't call it mindfulness. We don't call it meditation. We, we call it pondering. And pondering is when you sit with one concept. And so it's, it's, um, it's different than like a Vedic mantra-based meditation, but it's, it's in that it is more about the meaning of the concept versus the use of the mantra as a sound. Um, but then stillness and silence is a huge practice. And we have temples, we have church buildings where the normal church services happen every week. And that's where you have your youth group and Sunday school and, and, and sacrament meetings and choir practice and all of that. And then there are temples, which are separate. There's like maybe 7,000 church buildings around the world. And then there's like 200 temples around the world. And the temples are where special ceremonial ordinances take place um, that not even every member of the church ever goes into a temple. It's, it's sort of like a more, it's where more advanced ceremonies take place. And so I was raised to prepare to go to the temple. And so by age, I want to say like 14, I was performing these ordinances in the temples and in order to perform them and, and in order to be there, a practice of reverence. We always called it reverence, but the way that we define um, sort of like a spiritual definition of mindfulness is how we use the word reverence. So it's a deep respect, a quietness, an openness, a receptivity, you know. Um, you know, a lot of times I think mindfulness is like about the physical senses and it becomes like a little more clinical. That's That's not really what reverence is. Reverence is more the spiritual presence within the temple space, within the sacred space. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. If I was your childhood friend, right? 10, mm -hmm. 12 years old, I wanted to come and spend the, the, a couple of days at your house. Uh -huh. What would I have experienced that would be different from being in like a normal American household? Mm -hmm. What would well, I have seen in your house or heard? Well, a couple things are what you wouldn't have seen or heard. And so mm -hmm. some of the things that you wouldn't have seen or heard is my parents never use any kind of profanity. It's like really, really rare. You know, they're not like perfect about it, but it's like really rare um, for, for profanity. Uh, no smoking, no drinking, alcohol, no coffee. Um, the strict on those things, like definitely zero alcohol. I've never once ever seen alcohol in my, in my parents' home, you know, like very strict on alcohol, very strict on coffee. Those things were never in the home. Definitely no smoking in or around the home. Um, and so those are the things you would not have seen, but a couple of things that you would have seen is lots of pictures of Jesus everywhere. Lots of pictures of, um, temples so i mentioned that there are these temples all over the world they're kind of like these almost like futuristic elven like a lord of the rings elf temple palaces all over the world they're they're gorgeous if you were to google like lds temple or mormon temple they're they're exquisite uh and um 
and they're all very different. So they're all very much like unique architectural uh, expressions, you know. And so we have a, a lot of pictures of temples around the home. Um, statues of, of Jesus, pictures of Jesus, looking all different kinds of ways, different versions of Jesus. And also um, every morning we would have family prayer. And so every morning upon waking up, usually before we shower or have breakfast or anything like that, we all meet in the family room and we kneel in a circle and we, one of us says a, a prayer for the day. And um, they're not memorized prayers. They, there's a formula to them, but they're all, they all have to be, you have to take a deep breath and become very present and pray something from the present moment, from the heart, nothing memorized, nothing re repetitive, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's every morning before breakfast. And then another prayer before every single meal. And it's like a true blue family prayer, not like take a moment, close our eyes. Oh, so grateful for this food. Mm -hmm. Yep. And eat it. No, like literally everyone sits down, folds our arms, bows our head. No, not one bite of food. You may not have one bite of food until someone blessed that, that meal, mm. you know? So if you're my friend age 12, you're at my house and, and the pizza just got delivered. And you want to like open that box and grab a bite of pizza, you better check yourself because those that pizza better, we better be standing in a circle around the island in the kitchen, folding our arms, bowing our head, saying a blessing over that pizza before it goes, before one bite goes into your body. Um, and then of course, you know, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we say, we say those prayers. Um, and then in the evening, there's a little bit of a longer family prayer. So similar to the morning family prayer, but it's a, but it's a longer experience. And sometimes we would even sing a song. Um, every night we would read from the scriptures. We would read from the Bible and from the book of Mormon. And we would ponder on the message in the writing. So we would, we would read the scriptures and then we would sit in silence. We would meditate. And then we would we would usually start by singing a song. Then we would, we would talk a little bit and catch up with everyone about the day. And then we would read from the, the scriptures and then we would sit in silence and then we would say our evening prayer. And that evening prayer, that whole moment, that whole little mini ceremony is every single night. And it's after dinner and it's not immediately after dinner. It's like dinner and then TV, play around, catch up on homework, blah, blah, blah. And then th this last ceremony is right before bed. So after, after we say that last prayer, you go straight to bed. So were you bought in on all of this? Were you a devotee or were you like the rebellious? You're, you're getting drunk and high before you come in from school. And then you're pretending like <laughs> kind of like, cool with you. Kind of both, I think. A kind of mm -hmm. kind of both I was part of me from a really young age like I joined the priesthood when I was 12 mm -hmm. so it wasn't exactly getting drunk and high at age 12 you know um, but I mm -hmm. I joined the priesthood at age 12 I was performing these very elaborate uh, rituals purifying my ancestors baptisms and rituals for my dead ancestors one at a time in the temple so wearing ceremonial garb performing these rituals for individuals who were dead like very elaborate rituals in these palaces you know and you you go in to this temple which looks and feels like a palace wearing your suit and tie you go into the changing room and you change into the ceremonial garb and you never wear the ceremonial garb outside of the building no one ever sees it so it's all very much like you're in an alternate world because it's all your friends from the community but everyone's like wearing all white and you're in this like alternate universe and it's this palace and we're, we're doing these like special rituals and then you change and it's all, it's like you went to another, it's like an altered state you go into. So because of all of that and how elaborate it all was, I did have a lot of deep, sincere connection to it. 
And there's a part of me that was very genuinely bought in. And from a young age, I had a lot of supernatural experiences and the, the church and the community always validated the supernatural experiences and um, helped me cultivate those spiritual gifts. So I, I had, I had like a connection to the spirit world through the context of all of that. And so it was, it was very authentic for me in a, in a lot of ways. Of course, then as a teenager, I became rebellious and, you know, went through puberty and had my like sexual awakening and everything and, um, and, and did explore uh, alcohol and drugs. But really that was more later into my twenties, to be honest. Mm-hmm. It was, that was a little bit later. Um, but I definitely, I definitely embodied almost like a split personality where part of me was very, very committed. And another part of me was, uh, really questioning all of it, really seeking outside of the church, uh, for did, truth. How, how did the church, what, how does the church feel about, um, gays? <laughs> they, they like to think that they're very loving and welcoming (laughs) but the thing is um you can't get married you can't get you can't have a same-sex marriage within the church and um and the rule is if you're if you're gay you like can be gay but you can't ever act on it so you can never have sex and um (laughs) good luck with that right so yeah it's kind of a a tricky one you know so it's it so that was really the source of my feeling of of being unwelcome or needing to seek outside the church it wasn't really the spirituality because i actually felt really connected to the spirituality and i really liked the lineage that i had inherited and yes my ancestors started the religion 200 years ago but be all the the founders of the religion were high level freemasons so mm-hmm. a lot of the temple rituals and everything are similar to some of the higher level freemason ceremonial rituals and so there's a there's a lineage that goes back further than 200 years you know um through the masonic li- lineage and so there's a there are aspects within it that always deeply resonated but when you're when you start to realize that the way you love is never going to be accepted, you can never, there's no path for you. You have to leave. Mm -hmm. If you're going to survive. What did you, having had that background, now you're like a teenager, right? And you're, or maybe late teens, you're thinking about life beyond the church Mm -hmm. or being at home. What was your idea of success or where you wanted to, end up you know i my parents kept me really busy i was like in gymnastics and karate and um i had a voice coach and for years and so i was like a singer i was in a number of different choirs i was in a punk rock band for a little while um i played violin i was i was very busy with a lot of extracurricular activities and so for Mm -hmm. me in those extracurricular activities they have their vision of success so when i was playing violin the violin teacher had this vision for me to go be this like concert violinist. Uh, when I was singing, my, my vocal coach had this, you know, vision for me of becoming this like Grammy winning singer. When I was in the choir uh, and, and these like community choruses that, that were like hard to get into, like you had to audition and, and be like a real singer to get into like that. And you got paid to be in the choir and stuff like that. The, those choirs had their own vision of success where you would become this, you know, amazing professional choral performer as an adult. So a lot of, a lot, and, you know, acting, I was in acting classes and I was in a lot of plays and stuff like that. So a lot of the success was around um, performances, you know, being an actor, becoming a star, uh, the entertainment industry, very public facing, you know, so a lot of that was, was the dream around age 16. I was, I had a lot of depression and I was experiencing like suicidal ideation. And it, a lot of it was related to my sexuality. And that was when I, I, I started to explore meditation, Reiki 
hypnotherapy independently from my family. So that's when the exploration sort of, you know, began its like individuation process for me. And as a part of all of that, I, I never thought that would ever have anything to do with my career because I was about to go become a star. You know, I was going to go become an actor or a singer or both, you know? So it was very much, I had an, I had an agent, I had a modeling agent. I was, I was auditioning all over the place. Um, had a couple of gigs here and there. So the and, suicidal ideation, depression, was that linked to that trauma that you said you experienced as a child? Was there I some kind so. of sexual abuse or something that you Yeah, there was definitely um, a, a number of sexual abuse experiences I had um, as a young child. I think that I think that when you have a big family, I've got I've got five brothers. And when you're when there's a lot of kids around, um, you know, my my older brothers were close in age. My younger brothers were close in age. And I, I was a little bit of a, an outlier age wise. I was a. I was sort of a couple years apart from the older brothers and the younger brothers. So I was, it was like, dad would take the older brothers to football. Uh, Mom would take the younger brothers to wherever she was taking them. And then, you know, a babysitter or a friend from church or someone would take me to violin or take me to drama practice or whatever. And so when I was, I had just turned five years old. I was playing a shepherd in a church play and one of the church leaders who drove me from my parents' house to the church to be in this play during intermission. Well, first of all, he molested me on the drive in the car on the way in. And then during intermission, he molested me again. And then when he drove me home, he molested me again. And then every time I saw him for that period of time for the next year, he molested me again. And so there was a, a feeling of um, worthlessness and I, I didn't have a language for it at the time, but what amounts to like objectification, like not being a living being, but being an object. Uh, and I think that contributed a lot to the suicidal ideation. Also mm-hmm. having, I had already had a, I had already like come out to my parents before that even happened. I already told my parents that I like had this big crush on this guy and this girl, actually a guy and a girl. I was like, I actually is amazing. And so is Evan. I think I'm in love with both of them. And, um, and that was, that was before I was molested. Uh, but the, the, um, the combination of all of that internalized pain from the trauma plus being in a culture that did not have a long-term path for me um, made it feel like my life didn't matter and, and me growing old didn't matter and me getting married and having a family and, and building a long-term life didn't matter. And I think that's where the suicidal ideation really came from. Mm -hmm. And then is this when you embarked on the pilgrimages and the mission trips or was that later? (laughs) I think, um, you know, I went on like many local staycation style pilgrimages Mm -hmm. uh, around age 16 and 17 and 18. Um, That's when I I became a Reiki master when I was 16. I did my first yoga teacher training when I was 18. I became a hypnotherapist, a a certified hypnotherapist when I was 18. Um, Your parents obviously had means, right? Because you're doing all these trainings and workshops and those all cost they, a lot of money. They were, they were better than some, but, but not exactly rich, you know? And, um, you know, you've got six kids in the house. You, you got to have like major money for that to be like a rich situation. And, um, and we, we weren't, my parents worked really hard and we were really fortunate in a lot of different ways, but um, these trainings I'm referring to, I, I had to pay for when I was, mm-hmm. In in Ohio, you can work as young as age twelve. You, it's like legal for you to have a job at age twelve. And is and on my twelfth birthday, I got a job working at the grocery store, and I bagged groceries, I collect grocery carts, I cleaned the bathrooms. I never quite got the promotion to being a cashier, um, but I did take the trash. Out. I, I worked, and I worked from. 4.45 in the morning on Saturdays, that's when my shift started, 
until noon. And that was like my major shift each week. It was my longest shift each week was Saturdays from 4.45 in the morning till noon. My parents dropped me off and picked me up. Um, And the money that I made from that originally was going to me taking guitar lessons at the mall that was near the grocery store. And so I would walk to the mall, take my guitar lesson. And um, at the mall, there was this like new age shop that sold like sage and crystals and candles. And, and um, you know, then there was of course the bookshop and the bookshop had all these like Kama Sutra, which I really liked, you know, Kama Sutra and, and yoga and, and uh, the Tao Te Ching and all kinds of spiritual books and everything. So I, I, after a while, I wasn't really getting the hang of the guitar, the guitar teacher. I didn't really like him. One of my friends started to take guitar lessons from the same guitar teacher and he didn't like him either. So I kind of didn't tell my parents that I wasn't taking guitar anymore. And I started to go meet with this psychic at this little new age shop. And I started to sort of like ask her questions and learn about different things. And she was offering a Reiki training at the Mm. local library and the local library was walking distance from the, from the school. And so I, I, I started to do that and no one signed up for the Reiki training. So I was actually the only one in the Reiki training. And um, so, so yes, my parents did well. And so every penny that I made, I was able to spend on my, on myself. So they weren't really. Yeah. They would have been impressed by your work ethic. Did all your brothers have this kind of work ethic getting up at four o'clock in the morning to go work a seven hour (laughs) shift at the grocery store? I think think so. I think, I mean, I, I feel like they, my, my dad was very much like all about, you know, getting work done, being, being productive (laughs) He had a home building company. We always went to work with him and he put us to work and he worked too. He owned the company, but if he was there and something needed to be done and it needed to be done now, he would just do it. He was skilled mm-hmm. and able to do it himself. There, there were con, you know, people he would subcontract out to, to take care of the major things. But he was always like, if there was a bunch of sawdust all over the place and he wanted to tour the place, he would get a broom. He would sweep up the sawdust, you know? If there was, um, you know, something, a framing issue, he would take a hammer and, and frame something up. He would use the saw. And, and so we were always involved even way before age 12, when I got my first real job at a grocery store, you know? Um, and then, you know, I worked, I worked at the grocery store for a few years. Uh, and then I worked for my dad's company for like, I don't know, like $5 an hour or something like that. Um, and then I, you know, all of us had, had, had jobs. I worked as a caddy, as a, a caddy at a golf course, um, which that I hated carrying golf, golf clubs around and just standing there waiting for these like drunk old white men to like hit a ball and then walk to the next thing. Hated that, hated it. Like that was not for me. Um, but by age 16, you could work at, um, retail. So I worked at, um, Abercrombie kids from age 16, all the way to age 18. I turned 18 at the very beginning of my senior year in high school and got a job at Abercrombie and Fitch. Cause when you're 18, you can work at Fitch and, um, oh yeah. And I also, you, you multiple- still can hear anything after working at Abercrombie and Fitch so loud yeah. there. <laughs> no, I have no hearing, uh, hearing sm- and the sense of smell completely burned Yeah, your out smell from- is completely gone. <laughs> from all the cologne. Uh, but I also worked at um, three different restaurants at different times. And so there, was, there were times where I had like three different jobs mm-hmm. at once. You know, I would go from Abercrombie to the restaurant, like do an afternoon shift at, at Abercrombie, have like an hour break, and then get over to my, my job at, at Maggiano's. If you know that chain, I worked at Maggiano's in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, worked at a Brazilian Trascaria, worked at a Cajun restaurant, you know, so I think all of us, all my brothers, we, I think we all, um, my parents did well enough to make sure we had everything that we need and they would pay for some things like my acting classes and vocal coaching and stuff like that. But when it came when it came to anything else that we really wanted, like the like the guitar lessons, they didn't 
it didn't fall into the same category as piano or violin for them. So they paid for piano, they paid for violin, but they didn't pay for guitar. Mm. You know, they paid for what they wanted to pay for or what they mm-hmm. could pay for in those moments. And I think the same was true for my brothers. So I think we're, we were all very entrepreneurial also, like always like mowing people's lawns for money or whatever. Right. So this idea of Los Angeles was implanted into your psyche early on when you saw something on television about the city of angels. Um, right. How do we get to Los Angeles then from, from this point you're working in all these restaurants? Yeah. I had like this interesting combination of in the acting and performance world, they always said you go to LA or New York, New York Mm -hmm. is a lot harder. LA is more comfortable. And I was like, okay, that's me. LA sounds better. (laughs) Um, the beach and the mountains and everything that all resonated more. And there's also, um, so one part of it was for the entertainment industry. One part was for this spiritual part of me that was like, wow, angels, like there's something spiritual about this place. Um, And then when I was working at the restaurant, especially around age 16, I'm like, I'm like, now I'm not a little kid. I'm like, I look older than I am. I'm cute. I'm like this athletic, cute teen now. And, you know, people want to know my sexuality. You know, they're, everyone knew I was like bi or gay or whatever. And, um, and, and it was, it was hard in a really conservative community, but working at the restaurants, I felt really like accepted and welcomed. And they kept saying you know, you've got to go to LA. LA is a place where, um, you know, anywhere you go, you can really be accepted. And so there was like these three things that were like, LA is going to be a safe place for you. And as soon as I graduated high school, I went to college in Idaho at the Brigham Young University, Idaho campus, uh, which is started by one of my ancestors, Brigham Young. And um, it's the church's official university. Mm -hmm. And I was extremely depressed. And I was like a MySpace influencer (laughs) at the time. (laughs) And so I just used all my modeling photos to try to get meetings and everything in LA. And once I got a couple meetings in LA, I saved up about, I want to say like $600. And I just like got out of there. And I just like made my way to LA. I just, one day I just told my brother, I was like, I'm leaving and I'm not coming back. And Mm. we didn't even tell my parents for at least a month after that, that I had dropped, I had abandoned my classes. I abandoned (laughs) university and I moved to LA and I couch surfed and I didn't care. I was like, I'm, I'm, I, I can't be in that religious environment that doesn't want me there. I need to find my people. And I, I was auditioning like crazy. I, and, I, and I had a lot of anxiety. And when you go from being the cutest little boy in Mormon land over here to like actual LA where you're actually auditioning for real roles, you're not so cute anymore. Like, that's nice that you're cute in your little smart, small town. That's nice that you're talented in your cute little small town. This is LA now. You're not cute. You were a 10 where you're from. You're like a four here. You were a 10 (laughs) in acting where you're from. You're like, you're like, don't even rank here, you know? And so uh, anxiety, depression, major intensity, like increased dramatically once I got to LA and eventually Uh, pivoted out of acting and into PR. I was really good at social media and it was, it was at the very beginning of social media. And um, so I was helping create official MySpace accounts. That's how long ago this was uh, for, for clients and everything um, at, you know, actually at a major PR firm. Um, And so I got really good at, at PR, developed a lot of contacts and got a better offer at a, at a smaller PR firm. Worked for a couple of major studios, got a job at a smaller PR firm, 
where the founder of that PR firm really taught me what was up, really cultivated my abilities, really cultivated my skills. And, and eventually I outgrew that position and started my own firm. Now at this point, are you still praying over your meals and, you know, not drinking and doing all the, what's, what's your lifestyle like these days? Uh, I think to manage the anxiety and depression, I, I, I stopped going to church mm. around that time, around age 19. I went maybe like once a month instead of every single Sunday and every single Wednesday, you know, and because I just felt so much anxiety being there, feeling judged, feeling not accepted. And so even though I had moved to Los Angeles, I was still trying to go to church, still trying to have that community. It wasn't working. And um, in order to manage the anxiety, I just stopped going. And I really didn't drink until I was 21. And I had already been doing PR and I was like 19 and 20 doing PR, like, with a fake ID to even get into my own clients events. And um, my 21st birthday was like a key moment because I threw myself a, a party. And um, I, and it was like when all these reality shows were happening, keeping up with the Kardashians was like a brand new show. The Hills was like at its peak popularity, all these reality shows taking place in that, in that community of Hollywood, elite or semi-elite or wannabe elite and I threw myself a red carpet charity birthday event at a nightclub Le Do. Le Do is the name of the nightclub and it was like it was like hot stuff at the time it was like the hottest club and mm -hmm. I worked it out when I knew the hills was going to be filming that night and I got the Kardashians to come and it was like it meant nothing that the Kardashians were there. It meant nothing. Like today it would be like, wow, good job. But at the time it was so early in their career that it was like season one of keeping up with the Kardashians, you know, it was like, no one cared. And, um, and they did film the Hills. And so it was a, it was, it was like peak Hollywood energy for me at that time. And I was like, gonna get on the Hills. I was going to go be a reality star. I was going to make it happen. I was going to, fulfill my dreams by being a publicist and being a public figure. And, you know, and um, at that time I did start to drink. Mm -hmm. um, and it was more like I had an occasional binge drinking moment. I wasn't drinking regularly. I wasn't drinking daily. I almost never even bought alcohol, but I was doing PR for, uh, I, you know, one by one, I got better and better clients, bigger and bigger clients, bigger, and bigger contracts. And before you know it, I'm at the Playboy Mansion and I'm, and I'm on Playboy radio and I'm getting all these Playboy rate and I'm like booking guests for Playboy radio and, um, you know, staging fake paparazzi appearances with Playboy playmates and reality stars and all that kind of stuff. And it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was like, it was like peak energy. That community, I, I didn't know how fake it was because I, I just, I just was ignorant to it. But I felt really loved and really accepted and really celebrated at that time in my life. And so I, I really, I let. I, I did cocaine and I did ecstasy and I, um, drank, you know, cocktails at, at all these parties and, and I had sex with people that I had just met and, you know, I was living the lifestyle for a hot minute there, you know? Mm -hmm. So I wasn't exactly praying over all my meals and, um, avoiding all the things, you know? But you also had a conscience. You talked, I saw in a clip, you talked about how you would, you would try to tell these, some of these playmates, you know, who were being coerced into doing things. You don't really have to go through with that if you don't want to, right? Did you start to yeah. develop that reputation as this PR person with a conscience? Everyone knew I was Mormon and they were like, 
they were like, oh, dude, the Mormon who does PR for Playboy. Oh, geez. Is he like infiltrating Playboy to try to destroy the company? Is he like a Mormon plant to try to like shut down the whole industry? Um, you know, especially since there were times when I was on photo shoots with my clients who were visibly uncomfortable, who wanted to drink. They like wanted, I remember one client wanted to put a straw in a bottle of wine to get drunk, to feel comfortable posing nude. And I, and I, and I said, you really don't need to do this. And they were like, what? And she put her clothes on and we left. And so, so I definitely had a conscience because remember I had already been meditating. Mm -hmm. So, and I already had a personal life of using hypnotherapy and using uh, meditation. And um, it was about Breaking, age yeah. and Reiki. And it was about age 20 when I got my transcendental meditation mantra. And I, so it was all right at that time when I was already in TM and, um, and having a practice and, um, occasionally visiting the self-realization fellowship. There was a temple in Hollywood and a temple in the Palisades. Um, so I was definitely exploring, but I have to say, I was not exactly bringing friends to those things. I definitely wasn't taking pictures there. I definitely wasn't talking about it to anyone. It was a deeply intimate, personal thing. And so there was this part of me that was like, for the self-realization of this woman, she, you sometimes need an intervention. You sometimes need an angelic being or someone to say, you, you have permission to leave this situation. And I, I had this sort of like thought that in all these different circumstances, when someone was doing something that they didn't want to do, and I had authority more often than not, I was playing devil's advocate. I was like, you know, you, you could go this way, but you know, there's a lot of options, you know, even if something's hard for a little while, you know, things you do land on your feet and things do work out, you know, and um, it didn't make me a very effective um, PR person for someone who wanted to be like a playmate of the year. So when did everything come to a head then for your PR trend to transitioning out of PR to what you're ultimately doing now? Well, every red carpet event chipped away at my, at my spirit. Every, every nightclub experience weighed on me more heavily. Every, and the, the relationships that I had, the intimate relationships I had at that time, boyfriends and girlfriends were just so chaotic. And I did things that I regret and, and we were drinking and partying and it was just such a disaster. It was like, everything was exactly what you see on a, like a Bravo reality show that you don't want your, in your life, all of those exact things that you don't want. I had, mm -hmm. and, um, the, the biggest moment, the moment that really drew things to a head, you know, the, some of it was gradual because I, I was really trying to find meditation centers and there weren't really many or kind of like any that were outside of a religious community in LA um, so that was, that was a challenging thing. I would go to the Dharma Center and, and Insight LA and, a, you know, a couple other places here and there that were open. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, I was feeling unfulfilled, unfulfilled. I wasn't really finding what I wanted. And I, I heard about this spiritual teacher who was running for office. And it was Marianne Williamson. And I had mm -hmm. no clue who she was. I had never heard her name. Uh, that I was aware of, um, but I actually did read A Course in Miracles when I was 10 years old. So I, I, I must have had some kind of like introduction to her in order for me to even like materialize that book in my life. Um, but I remember sitting on the floor in a yoga studio and she was talking about her campaign for Congress. And she talked about David and Goliath and the capstone of the pyramid of Egypt. <laughs> and like getting money out of politics. And I was like, damn, this is an interesting person, you know? And I started to have this thought like, wow, I could actually represent people like that. I could represent people who are more like me, more like authentically like me, like this person. 
And so I started to support her campaign. I did a lot of fundraisers for her campaign, got really, really, really hands-on. About that time, we opened Full Circle and I was still doing PR. And I opened Full Circle and I'm like, whoa, this is like my passion. This is amazing. Like all these things that I've been doing for years, someone cares about. There's other Mm -hmm. people who even care about meditating, who are even interested in any of this. Like, holy crap, I had no clue this even existed. And not long after we opened Full Circle and um, there's a couple of other things that happened. Like I, I had found an anti-human trafficking organization uh, when I was 21. I raised a bunch of money for the anti-human trafficking organization, was stayed in touch with that, that whole field of work. Um, but actually about this time after, ab- about the time of Marianne Williamson coming into my life, I had gotten really involved, took a full-time position at an anti-human trafficking organization while I still had my PR firm. And so just like always, I had multiple jobs at once, just like always, I was busy, you know, up at four in the morning, just like always. And um, there was a a vortex of things that happened where the anti-human trafficking work, I started to realize like the the hypersexualization and culture was actually contributing to something negatively in the, in the collective psyche that mm. was like creating and perpetuating and allowing for sex trafficking to, to happen from like a metaphysical perspective. And then I was like, wow, I can't do PR for, for these, for this industry anymore. It's not about the women or the individuals. It was more about this industry. I was like, wow, I, I have to step away from that. And I started to feel myself pull away from that, embrace the charity work, deepen my connection to meditation, open, open myself up to sharing meditation with other people. And I had already been a yoga instructor for, for years by then. Um, I had been certified for years. I hadn't been teaching for years, but I, I hadn't hardly taught anything, but I had already become a yoga instructor by then. And, um, and one day... I was with a friend and I was, and I was like, something's changing. I I can feel something really intense changing. And she and I were smoking weed in the middle of a sunny summer day in LA. And we were in her backyard of the house that she inherited from her grandparents. And it was so overgrown and there's like decades of junk in the backyard and we're, we're clearing out the backyard and I'm like being of service, helping my friend and my phone rings. And I look at my phone and I have this sense of dread just drop in my stomach. And I have like all my, my intuition, like volume turned way up. And I was like, something really bad is happening right now. And I looked at my friend and I said, I don't want to answer this phone call. And she's standing there with two glasses of lemonade in her hand that she had just made for us. And she was like, her eyes filled with tears. And she said, something bad just happened, didn't it? And I said, yeah. And she said, you need to answer that, that call. And I answered the call and I, and it was on speakerphone. I said, Hey, and it was one of my clients and she was this model. And, and she said, something bad happened, Ben, something really, really bad happened. I have to give you some really, really bad news. Okay. Can you, can you hear some very bad news right now? And she had just filed for divorce and her husband slash soon to be ex-husband had just died by suicide that morning. Um, he went to a shooting range in the Valley. There was, he struggled with depression for a very long time. Um, and there were some really s- close calls over the years, but um, he, he went to a shooting range and um, shot himself in the head. Mm. at a public shooting range. And um, we, we talked about it and, and I said, look, the public is going to be asking about this. I'm so sorry. Let me know how I can help. And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please help. Please help like manage the public statements and stuff. And I said, okay, my honor, I, I'm happy to help. And um the reality of that started to settle in once some of the other friends, some, some members of the community started to tip off the media. 
and the news found out and TMZ found out and all these different outlets found out and cut to two days later, I'm in the car on the way to my friend's funeral. His parents didn't come to it. It was just such very intense energy. It was very chaotic and very crazy. And all of the friends, all of our mutual friends were like blaming each other. And, and, and it was so negative and harsh and angry and no one knew how to manage it. And it was just horrible, just like the scariest, most horrible, traumatizing thing. We were all frozen. We, we, none of us were prepared on any level to navigate that situation. And, um, on the drive to that funeral, I got a call. I was getting phone calls back to back to back to back. And I answered one. And it was a woman that I knew, I had known for years from People Magazine. And she said, I am so sorry about his passing, you know, and I'm just avoiding saying his name. And um, I said, thank you so much. You know, I'm, I'm just like heartbroken. I'm devastated. I'm completely in shock. We're, we're on our way to the funeral right now. And she said, Oh, I'm so sorry. This is going through. I want to help you. Let me know what the statement is. And it dawned on me that she was looking for a scoop that she wanted the story. And it just, I said something and she ran it. And the fact that I even said something infuriated so many people in the community. And I was like, please remove my name from that. And it took her three days to do it. And all these other outlets already picked up the statement. And it was just a horrible disaster of chaos. And I was like, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this anymore. I don't care if I'm gonna be broke. I'm gonna go do the spiritual center thing. I'm, I'm going to only do yoga and meditation. I am, I'm not perpetuating and popularizing any of this anymore. I'm going to help people heal from this. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. And, um, you know, the, the biggest tool and the biggest gift I had in that moment that gave me the energy I needed to, to heal through that process and make my life transition it looks on the surface like a professional transition but really it's a complete life redirection was i called marianne williamson who i had already developed a relationship with and already knew and um i told her what happened and she actually knew him because he had hosted fundraisers for her campaign so she had already met him and already knew this person who died and she said she said a prayer for me and she said look you've got to call david kessler David Kessler um, coined the five stages of grief with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in his book on grief and grieving. He is like the world's foremost expert on grief. Um, he recently came out with a book called Finding Meaning, the sixth stage of grief, you know? And she was like, you've got to talk to him. And I was like, great, thank you. And then of course I didn't. She did an email intro and of course I did not respond to it. <laughs> and um and that was the pivotal turning point. That was the major unraveling of my career in entertainment industry and basically never going back. Did you have money saved up? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> not a because single this, penny. How are you I'm thinking about success penny. these days, um, Ben? What, what, what does that mean to That's you? That's such a tricky one. You know, it's like so much of... Uh, like, you know, you've got a podcast, I've got a podcast. Um, my producers are, are giving me these like reports on downloads and on traffic. And, and now they're like analyzing my social media and, and my, my plays and likes and engagement are, are all being analyzed, which feels so um, uncomfortable and, and makes me feel like super exposed, you know? And, and so there's, and my, and like my newsletter numbers and my book sales numbers. I used to just like watching my book sales numbers. Cause it was like, Oh, great. That one's doing well. That one's kind of not, uh, okay. What can I do? Mm -hmm. You know? And, um, as a writer, as a creative, the exciting part is writing the book. Um, and, and getting the, it's like painting the painting, sculpting the sculpture. The exciting part's not marketing the sculpture or marketing the painting or marketing the book. <laughs> That's like the least fun part. So, I'm, I'm feeling less and less enchanted by engagement 
and by downloads and by sales. I, I, I thought that, yeah, I've been like talking to her about this next book that I'm book number five that I'm writing. And it's like, I just am not turned on by having to like increase my numbers in order to be able to write another book. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like what, you know, so success, I'm in a really interesting place in this moment where look, we're in a world where there are people that will not be receptive to my message. We're mm-hmm. in a world where there are, and, and, you know, we're, we're in a world where there's an act, there's actual proactive wars. And in order for there to be wars, there's need to be people who are signing up for the military. Uh, there need to be people who are um, supporting these officials that are, are contributing to these policies and, and it's an entire, very entrenched, very complicated reality. And, and because that exists in the world, it's, it's clear that I may not exactly be someone that will sell hundreds of millions of copies of the books that I'm writing. And I'm, and I'm in a place of sort of allowing that to dawn on me. I've, I've had success and, and I, I continue to be successful. Uh, from like the normal world standards where like financially I'm comfortable and, and the sales continue. Um, and the podcast is successful and all of that, like, you know, people are listening to it and people are engaging and people are agreeing to can be the guests on it. And, you know, all of those things by the normal world standards, but in my heart, I'm, I'm in a transition point and it's a different kind of transition point than I shared when my friend died and I made a full career pivot, but I recently tried to go to the Vipassana center in Bali to seek that 10 days of silence. And they once again, rejected me. You're on like a, there's like a photocopy next to the door with people's faces (laughs) on it. You're one of those people. Do not let this guy in here. They're like, don't let him in. He's going (laughs) to silently repeat a mantra in his mind next to us. And we're going to hear him psychically. And that's like very serious, you know, and I, I respect that. um, But also as a person in this world, I don't know if that's what the world needs more of people being rejected from meditation places because they meditate in other ways. It's like, is that what the Buddha wanted? Like, like, I don't know. I wasn't, I don't know him, but something tells me that ain't the vibe, you know, something Mm. tells me that's not what he was uh, really visioning for his lineage, you know, to be engaging with the world in that way, you know? Uh, So I'm, I'm really in a place of, even though on one level, I'm, I'm very external with, with the increase of energy around the podcast and, you know, art, I've been doing a lot of media and publicity and everything lately. uh, But what I'm really feeling now, I feel what is success for me, right? The second is I can tell that there is a new layer to go through, a new depth for me to saturate. There's things about me that I need to learn with all of what's come up the last few years around race in the collective as a white person. There's, Mm -hmm. there's some deep, I had this whole, I had this whole ayahuasca ceremony where the ayahuasca took me to whiteness anonymous meetings. And it like took me through the 12 steps of like, unconscious racial bias and the acceptance of privilege and and the inheritance of of racial karma and you know there's there's just like so much to just be with you know and um and i think that success for me is the ability to be in my creative place and in my spiritual practice in a way that's that's not judged based on evaluation um I want to be able to paint and write poetry and write songs and sing and write a book, not based on whether I have enough engagement for Random House to want to buy the book, you know? And Mm -hmm. I'm just feeling, especially in this time of war, where it's like, I want to create something from my heart that feels authentic and feels real and feels beautiful. And I, I don't want to be afraid to confront my demons. I want to like, I want to like channel Buffy. I want to like take on the demons head on. I want to like take Mm -hmm. them out. I want to like 
excavate my, my inner world and confront the shadow and bring the light into the dark places. Um, and what that looks like is really a, a simple life, you know, more, more of a personal life with deeper, m- more intimate relationships and less about uh, large audiences and, and book sales and things like that. I love it. I think that's the final stage of enlightenment right there. So <laughs> that's a good place. I to, think, I think I'm like it. at the, I, all I know is that I don't have it. All mm-hmm. I know is that, that I'm not enlightened, you know? And it's like, I want to love more deeply. I want to, I want to help more authentically. Uh, and I don't want to have to perform. I don't want to have to put on a show. I don't want to have to over edit, but I also don't want to harm through my ignorance. I think editing ourselves, we're like, be authentic. And it's like, yeah, but bitch, sometimes your authentic self is ignorant. Mm-hmm. I don't want to be that. I don't want to mm-hmm. be ignorant anymore. And I don't want my authentic self to express out into the world and spew and proliferate wrong thinking. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm kind of like, maybe I don't need to write another book right now. Maybe I need to like sit down and shut up. I might learn something, Mm. you know? So I'm kind of like in a place where I don't want to be like self-deprecating and too hard on myself, but I also feel like, wow, dude, the world has major problems. Like, like take a breath, you know, like, let's see what, what can come through, through a, a deeper sense of recalibration and healing. Beautiful. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.